Every once in a while I see jumping spiders in the fish room. Here's one crawling on the underside of an aquarium cover. I think the spiders are searching for bugs that are drawn in by the aquarium lights. Now I don't have a problem with the spiders and there are several different species that live in my home rent free. But my favorites are the jumping spiders. And maybe it's just me, but I think they're adorable. So I've been researching and filming these amazing spiders on and off for several years now, and I'm really hooked. There are over 5,000 species of jumping spiders, and you can find them all over the world except for in the coldest regions of the North and South Poles. Most jumping spiders only reach a length of about half an inch, or around 13 millimeters. But they can catch and eat things that are almost twice their size. Typical prey items include small insects like crickets, moths, caterpillars, flies, bees, and even other spiders. Female jumping spiders can have upwards of 200 or more babies per egg sac. A bite from a jumping spider is about as painful as a bee sting, but they're not typically aggressive and they'd prefer to run away than bite. They live for about one to two years and they're one of the most intelligent and curious of all spiders. They have eight legs like all other spiders and they also have eight eyes, which allows them to see in many different directions all at once. Jumping spiders have excellent eyesight. These two massive eyes at the front are called the primary eyes. They provide the spider with a very detailed view of its surroundings and are important for helping it to judge distances. These eyes have retinas that can move around inside the eye, which allows them to function like telescopes so that they can focus on things that are very far away. These other, smaller eyes along the side are the jumping spider's secondary eyes, and they're used for peripheral vision and to detect motion, but these eyes don't provide a lot of detail. So, when the spider detects movement with its secondary eyes, it quickly turns its body so that the primary eyes at the front are pointed right at the target, allowing the spider to get a detailed view of the object and determine exactly how far away it is. And for a long time, it was believed that jumping spiders relied primarily on their eyes to gather information about the world around them. But it's been recently discovered that these spiders also have excellent hearing as well. In fact, they can hear someone clapping their hands from 10 to 15 feet away. And they're able to do this by using tiny hairs on their legs to pick up vibrations from their surroundings. Scientists have also discovered that these hairs are most sensitive to a specific range of frequencies that are produced by the wing beats of parasitic wasps that are known to target jumping spiders in particular. So these hairs seem to be used for detecting the presence of predators as well as prey, but there's still so much that we don't know. However, one thing is for certain. Jumping spiders are very skilled hunters that don't just blindly rush at their prey. They watch, they wait, they follow, and they plot before deciding on the best approach to catch their next meal. And when they're ready to strike, they jump on their prey. Some species of jumping spiders can jump up to 50 times the length of their body. These jumps are highly controlled and targeted, and rather than using their muscles to jump, these spiders use a pressurized fluid to rapidly straighten out their third and fourth legs so that they can propel themselves over incredibly long distances. It's a complex system of hydraulics rather than muscles that powers their incredible leaps, but exactly how it's done is still not completely understood.
As the spider moves, it uses its spinnerets at the end of its abdomen to lay down a thread of silk along the path. This thread acts as a tether or a drag line for the spider, so that when the spider jumps, if it misses the target, it's still attached to the drag line so that it won't fall very far. But even more importantly, this drag line helps to stabilize the spider when it jumps, so they don't wobble at all as they fly through the air, and their jumps are remarkably accurate. Now, if you focus your attention on this area right here, you'll be able to see the spider use its two spinnerets to attach a thread of silk to this leaf just before it jumps. It's having a little bit of trouble finding a good spot to put one of its legs so that it can jump. Nonetheless, the silk produced by the spinnerets isn't used to create webs for catching prey because jumping spiders are active hunters who don't wait around for their meals to come to them. However, they do use their silk to create a little den of sorts, which is also called a hammock. This enclosure is where they go to sleep, escape the rain, lay their eggs, and molt. While most spiders use a sit-and-wait strategy where they weave an elaborate web and wait for the prey to become trapped in the sticky threads, the jumping spider uses a very different approach. They're active hunters that track their prey and strategize before they make their move in order to maximize their effectiveness. Furthermore, while most spiders hunt for things that are smaller than they are, our friend the jumping spider can take down prey up to twice its size. And while most spiders are nocturnal, jumping spiders are diurnal, which means that they're active during the day. And I guess this makes sense because that's when their incredibly sharp eyesight would be most effective. And like all spiders, the jumping spider subdues its prey by injecting it with a cocktail of different chemicals that paralyzes the prey and then liquefies the tissues so that they can be ingested by the spider. The spider delivers its venom using a pair of curved fangs known as chelicery. The chelicery work like a vice to clamp onto the prey and then deliver their deadly venom. Right beside the chelicery are these arm-like appendages known as pedipalps. The pedipalps have several functions. They're used to help the spider handle its food. They also function as taste and smell organs, and they're used by the males to transfer reproductive material to the female when they mate. On males, the pedipalps are often enlarged and are used in elaborate mating displays to impress the females. On the females, the pedipalps are much smaller and have a more simple design than what you see on the males. These multifunctional appendages are one of the most reliable ways to tell a male from a female jumping spider, but there are several other ways as well. Females tend to have a big plump abdomen, while the abdomen of the males is usually smaller and a bit more narrow. The females are also larger than the males and tend to be a bit more shy, but these last two traits are far less accurate. Nonetheless, jumping spiders are solitary creatures that only come together for the purpose of mating. In fact, a female jumping spider will sometimes eat one of her male suitors if he doesn't live up to her expectations. So, you shouldn't keep more than one jumping spider in the same enclosure. And if you do put two of them together with the intention of breeding them, then you'll need to watch them very closely to be sure that the female is receptive to the male. And if you sense that it's trouble and she's not ready, then it's a good idea to remove the male, because if she's hungry, she might decide to eat him. However, if the pairing is successful, the male will then need to be removed from the enclosure. The female will lay the eggs one to two weeks after mating, and she can store the male's reproductive material so that she never needs to mate again. 
And when the female is ready to lay her eggs, she'll spin a silk sack in her hammock where she'll place the eggs for protection. It usually takes about two to four weeks before the eggs hatch and the baby spiders become visible in the mother's hammock. The babies are super tiny and they're often referred to as slings, which is a shortened version of the word spiderling. The tiny slings will stay in the hammock until they finish their first molt. Then they'll begin to leave the hammock one by one as they grow stronger and stronger. In captivity, the baby spiders are fed fruit flies and springtails, and the little spiders are so delicate they can even drown in a tiny drop of water. The babies are okay to keep together for a while, and as long as they're well fed, they don't usually try to eat each other. But by the second or third molt, they'll need to be housed in separate containers. Because, as I mentioned earlier, jumping spiders are solitary creatures who only interact with each other when they get together to mate. So in many ways, jumping spiders are a little like betta fish when it comes to breeding because after a certain age, everyone needs to be kept in their own enclosures. And it's a lot of work to feed and care for a hundred or more baby spiders, each of which lives in its own container. So if you'd like to breed your jumping spiders, be prepared with several live food cultures and lots of tiny containers to house the baby spiders. Both the adults and their babies will need to be provided with fresh water each day. This is done by spraying a very fine mist on one side of the enclosure, and it's best to do this early in the day in order to simulate the morning dew. It is not recommended that you give them a bowl of water to drink from, because large pools of water can be fatal for a jumping spider. In fact, spiders and water do not get along at all, and here's the reason why. When the jumping spider is dry, it can run on the surface of the water, but once it gets wet, the surface tension of the water causes it to stick to the spider like glue, which can make it very difficult for the spider to breathe. The openings for the spider's respiratory system are located on the underside of its abdomen. These openings are called spiracles, and each spiracle acts like a door so that it can be open or closed. There's a single spiracle at the end of the spider's abdomen just in front of the spinnerets, and there are two more openings towards the front of the abdomen that lead to the spider's book lungs. The book lungs are air-filled cavities that have what looks like pages of a book suspended inside. These pages of the book maximize the surface area available for the spider to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. If the spider sits for too long in a pool of water, it won't be able to breathe, so do not allow pools of water to accumulate in your enclosure. And if your spider does get drenched in water like the one seen here, then you'll want to remove the spider from its enclosure and place it in a cup on top of a crumpled up paper towel so that it can dry itself off. Which is exactly what was done here. And it's important to note that no spiders were harmed in the production of this film. But I can't say the same for the crickets, because several of them did suffer so that this spider could live. And I bear the crickets no ill will, but life being what it is, we all need to eat, so something needs to give. The video you're about to see has not been sped up. There's a jumping spider right here, and it's about to grab this cricket. And if you blink, you'll miss it. Jumping spiders are incredibly fast, so let's watch that again.
I'm so glad that this little spider wandered into my fish room and that I decided to turn my camera away from the fish and towards this tiny little creature with the great big eyes. And now my goal is to film as many species of jumping spiders as I can. I'd like to capture all aspects of their behavior, from their hunting strategies to their incredible jumps, as well as the elaborate courtship displays of the males. I'd also like to film the female in her hammock with her egg sac, and then later on film her when the tiny babies begin to emerge. It's an ambitious project to be sure, but I think that these incredible little spiders deserve to have their lives captured on film so that other people can experience the same fascination that I felt when I first looked into the camera and saw those great big eyes staring back at me.